Hello, friends and family. This is Agape Christian Worship Center under the leadership of Pastor Eric and First Lady Tasha Allison. We would like to invite you to come and worship with us on our online service Sunday mornings at 11.30 a.m. We are a Bible teaching church, and it is our mission to reach out to the lost, to serve in our community, and to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray that you will be blessed by a song that is sung, a word that is preached, or by the love we have to give. Come and worship with us as we give glory unto God. We are Agape Christian Worship Center, where God abides and love abounds. God bless. Good morning again. Uh, welcome to Agape Christian Worship Center here on this Resurrection Sunday. Uh, we'll be in the Word today, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and Colossians chapter 2, and we'll be talking about the graveless gospel. Uh, join me in prayer, please. Father God, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you. We bless you now, God, that you risen. We celebrate the fact that we serve a live Savior. God, we bless your name today for the power of your word and how the revelation knowledge of your word as it pertains to the power of your resurrection and what it means to us as believers, God, is paramount, God. We thank you, oh God, that you uh, went to the grave, but most importantly, God, we thank you that you got up. Now, God, we pray now that your preaching and teaching anointing fall fresh on your servant, that the power of the revelation knowledge of your word, God, will permeate through the hearts and minds of your sons and your daughters on this morning. God, we pray right now for, for revelation. We pray right now for, for enlightenment. We pray right now, God, for inspiration. God, we pray right now for education and awareness in the name of Jesus. God, set us free. Fill us up, O oh God. We thank you right now for your spirit that you speak to me, speak through me, and speak for me, God, that no flesh glory in your sight, but that all that is said and done be done to your glory. Let me pour out everything that you pour in. We thank you, O oh God. Now, God, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, that they both be acceptable unto your sight. Oh, God, you are my strength and redeemer. It's this prayer that your servant offers up in the matchless and holy name of your son, Christ Jesus, our savior, our redeemer, and our risen king. Amen. And amen. The first Corinthians chapter 15. Um, I'll begin the reading at verse number 12. And we will go into verse number 20. And we'll look at Colossians as we prepare to go. Um, here's what the Bible says. Now, if Christ be preached, that he rose from the dead. How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain and your faith is also in vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he has raised up Christ whom he's raised not up. If so be that, the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then Christ is not raised. And if Christ be not raised, then your faith is in vain, and you are still in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. Look at verse 20. It says, but now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the first fruits of them that slept. The graveless gospel. Paul here is, is doing a marvelous job of really preaching and teaching about the importance of the gospel. And all of you out there, let me tell you something so, so, so intricately important before we even get rolling here. Is that there are two gospels that are being preached. Or two gospels that are permeating throughout our existence in this time frame. Let me tell you what it is. The first gospel is preached and, and the preaching really is about uh, a grave that's full, a grave that's occupied. Here it is. Look, look, look. Uh, the first grave is spoken um, uh, uh, by a preacher who's been around a whole long time. This preacher who preached this gospel uh, is not very popular, but it preached before many people. Matter of fact, this preaching, this gospel that I speak of now has been preached throughout all of eternity and had been preached millions and millions and millions of folks. This, 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 this gospel, 
The tombstone is their pulpit and the newspaper is their text. This gospel preacher cannot be bribed. He's unrelenting. He's unbiased. He's unconcerned about your time. He makes even the strongest of men weep. Who am I speaking of in this particular gospel? The gospel that I'm speaking of now is the gospel of death. But then there's another gospel. The gospel that is preached really in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, where it speaks of a Christ who has been alive and who has been buried and who has been risen again and he's coming back. This gospel that we preach now speaks of a gospel of a risen savior. And so we have these two gospels now, the gospel of a grave that is occupied and the gospel of a grave that is vacant by Christ who has been risen. And we see these two gospels now uh, really, really within the crux and the tension of our existence. And I want to preach to you today and teach to you today something very, very important that if we don't grasp the fact that the gospel that we have been saved under is about a gospel of a Christ that was in a grave and has been risen from a grave. If we pull the grave out of the gospel, what we have now is a gospel that looks like the gospel of death. And if our gospel looks like the gospel of death, then we have no gospel. And then if we have no gospel, we have no salvation. And if we have no salvation, our lives have no purpose. The issue here is that I want to preach to us today is why we have a church and why we have a gospel and why we have folks that have been preaching, teaching a graveless gospel. Last week, we talked a lot about the cross. And let me help you with the cross because the cross was very important. Last week, we talked about Christ who was a curse for us. And he took the curse of sin and he took the curse of our damnation. And what he did was, was take it to the cross. Isn't it powerful how we learned last week about Jesus who neglected to use his godly muscles. This Jesus who told the woman at the well that he was the water. And if you drink of that water, you'll never be thirsty. That same Jesus now found himself dehydrated on the cross and his organs are shutting down and every part of his body is cringing because he has no water. The same Jesus that said he was the water now says, I thirst. This same Jesus who can walk on water now had a hard time just walking on land. This same Jesus who was a carpenter and knew how to work wood now finds himself with this cross on him and the wood is now working him. This same Christ who whipped everybody and cleansed the temple now find himself being whipped, his blood streaming and his organs being exposed and his tendons and his muscles being exposed because of the flesh eating design of the whip. This same Jesus that said he was the light of the world now find himself on the cross and darkness is all over the land. This same Jesus that went around healing everybody now finds himself at the point of death. See, the cross was what God used in his ultimate brilliance to take the very thing that was killing us and used it to save us. The curse of sin, the poison of sin, God used it as the antidote to save us. And so Christ was a symbol of that curse, but yet and still he used that same curse to save us. See, the power of the cross is here. So let's look at it now, because as we talk about the cross, the cross really introduced us to the fullness of salvation. See, when you look at salvation, you look at three things. Let me help you, people of God. You have the cross, you have the blood, and you have the grave. <laughs> oh, God. Let me give you some revelation about the cross here as it relates to the grave. Because if you have the cross without the blood, without the grave, we have no gospel. And the gospel of death is what reigns. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is null and void. But thanks be to God that God gave layers and dimensions to the cross. Here's another dimension for you. See, the wooden cross really represents an altar. If you look at uh, the book of Ezekiel, it talks about how God instructed to build the altar with wood. 
See, that cross behind me is more than just the vertical relationship between God and man. It's more than the horizontal relationship between man and man. It is literally an altar that God has placed his son on. How do I know? Give me some, ooh, let me give you some word. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5 and 7 that Christ is our Passover lamb. The Bible says that he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. When John introduced him to the world, he says, there go the lamb. That's coming to take away the sins of the world. Pastor, what are you saying? I'm saying here that Christ was the lamb that was slain and the altar that he was slain on was the cross. How do I know? Listen to me here. In the Bible, you will know or in history, you would know that when Jesus Christ died the same hour, the same time that he crossed, the Bible says that when the priests were in the temple doing their sacrifice, in other words, their sacrificial lambs were being slain, but Christ was slain at the exact same time. And the Bible says the veil of the temple ripped from top to bottom. Why are you speaking of this? I want you to understand that Christ used the cross as an altar to lay down and give himself for the sins of the world. So that's the first dimension of the cross. But the second dimension of the cross is that God sent his son Christ to the cross so that he may bleed. The blood is what's important. The crown of thorns on his head, that drew blood was important. The blood that came from him from the inside out was important. The blood that came from his hands were important. The blood that came from his feet were important. When they pierced him in the side and the blood came from his side, all of that was important. Why? Because blood represents a remission of sin. The Bible says there in Hebrews 9, chapter, chapter 9, verse 22, it says that without the shedding of blood, there'll be no remission of sins. Now, ooh, watch it carefully. The shedding of blood does, or the remission of sin does not mean that sin goes away. He did not die. The blood did not make us sinless, but the blood should have made us sinless. See, the issue here is, is that the blood did not take away your sinfulness. It took away what will kill you. It took away the penalty of sin. When you talk about a disease and remission, the disease is still there, but the life taking element is snatched away. God snatched away the life changing element of death through the blood that was shed on the altar, which was his cross. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter nine, verse 12, it says not the blood of calves or bulls or anything else, but Christ through his own blood sought eternal redemption for us. That through the blood of Jesus that was shed on the altar of the cross for our sins, the Bible says now that we are dealing with the elements of salvation. The Bible says that we have been reconciled, Colossians 1.20 through the blood of his cross. So you have the cross and you have the blood of Jesus that was shed from the cross for the remission of our sins. Now we have the grave. It's so powerful when Christ was on a cross. He said, it is finished. I love that terminology because it is finished, but he didn't say it was over. Oh, I wish I could see your face today, beloved. There's some folks out there that have broken up with somebody more than four times. And every time you broke up with that person, you said it's finished. <laughs> but the reality is one of the two of you knew that it may have been finished, but it wasn't over. Look how God uses the cross to finish the work. But even though it's finished, it ain't over. See what the cross does is on one end is used for blood to be shed. And on the other end is used to display the power of God who is able to raise up Christ from the dead. See, Christ came for one reason and one reason only. It was to come and go to the cross and shed his blood and get to the grave. He came to redeem us. He came to take the sting out of death. He came to bring us to a place that he will bring us a grave gospel. The gospel is rooted on the fact that Christ rose. He came just to go to the grave. He unlocked an eternal reality for us. Oh God, can I give you some revelation here? God, when Adam was created, you notice he wasn't created as a baby and grew to Adam. Don't miss this revelation. He was created already grown and mature. Why? 
Because the intention of God's relationship with man was that man and God was to live eternally together. Watch me. Our, intent, our, 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 our existence was to be eternal. But sin crept in. And now, instead of having an eternal existence, we now have a linear existence. Okay, so, so, so once sin entered in, now people have age expectancy or life expectancies. People live in the 900s. And you find all the way down to Psalms 90 verse 10, the Bible says that we were granted 70 years. If you get 80, that's favor. In other words, uh, uh, now, now, now because of sin, there is a limitation. There is no more eternity. But now we live in a linear existence. Uh, uh, also, OK, OK, stop right here. Go in your cabinets and look at anything and you'll see a date on it. And the date says that something has expired. And just like that item in your cabinet has, ex has an expiration date, now because of sin, instead of living eternally, we live linearly. And now we have an expiration date. Why is that important? Because without Christ raising from the dead, when that line runs out, we fall off. But look what Christ does. Through the power of of his resurrection, he takes eternity that was here and eternity that was lost through sin and he gives us an opportunity to have eternal life. So now where life ends, eternity now begins. That's why the Bible says from everlasting to everlasting, he's God because he has taken eternity that was intended and eternity that will be our ending place. And made us live again. Thank God that the cross was a check that he wrote and the blood was the currency and the resurrection was proof that the check cleared. Christ gave us eternal life through the resurrection of himself from the grave. So now Paul, God. So now Paul here is teaching here because somehow, some way, the simplicity of the gospel was not enough. Somehow, some way, the people of Corinth felt that a graveless gospel was stronger than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Somehow, some way, the resurrection of Christ was not good enough. People of God, let me help you with something. Even though they had that problem in the church of Corinth, we see that problem in the 21st century church today, that somehow, some way we have found a way to take Christ out of our gospel. Somehow, some way the risen savior is too boring for us. And now we are living in an age where there is a graveless gospel. And Peter is Paul, excuse me, Paul is speaking to the church in Corinth and trying to warn them and inform them that you cannot have a graveless gospel. In this text, look at verse 12. He says, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Look at verse 13, listen at verse 11 though. He says, therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and you believed. Wait, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Verse 11, they believed. And verse 12, they stopped believing. Mmm, mmm. Mm. Nerd time. Your pastor's a nerd. Here it is. I'm going to teach you a word. W what was going on here was that there were Greek philosophers and Greek scholars who came and attacked the gospel of the resurrected Christ. And their ideology was called philosophical dualism. Don't let that fancy word scare you. I got you. I got you covered. Philosophically, dualism means that inherently everything that is spiritual is good and everything that is material or natural is bad. Come here. So they're saying that your spirit is trapped into this tainted, corrupt, horrible flesh. And so the joy is that when you die, your perfect spirit is now released and goes into an afterlife with other perfect spirits that are free from the contamination of this material and physical world. That was their thought. Their thought was that all things that are spirit is good and all things that is flesh is bad. 
Let me help you. Because that thought has so many holes in it, it don't make no sense. Watch this. If you are going to an afterlife with other good things and other good spirits and other perfect things, my question here is uh, that you have misidentified what paradise is. See, paradise is not the absence of evil. Paradise is the presence of God. See, what makes heaven heaven is not all these wonderful things. Yes, the streets of gold and yes, the, uh, the pearly gates and yes, all these awesome things. But what makes heaven heaven is that you're in the presence of God. Paradise is in the presence of God. Let me give you some word. Jesus, when he was dealing with the thief, he says, Jesus, will you remember me when you enter your kingdom? Just what Jesus tells him. He says, today you will be with in paradise. See, the whole thought of thinking that you have an afterlife absence of God, it is not paradise. It is actually hell itself. And so their thoughts of things being so perfect in their spiritual self was flawed. The second flaw that they had was if flesh is bad and the spirit is good, they taught that it doesn't matter how you act. You can act how you want to act because the flesh is bad anyway. Ooh, let me help you with that. Be careful of any teaching that tells you that how you act don't matter. Be careful of any doctrine that tells you that sin don't matter. Here's why it's important. Because if you are under the ideology or the theology or the false theology that sin don't matter, then grace don't matter. And if grace don't matter, then mercy don't matter. And if mercy don't matter, then repentance is not necessary. See, they want to make you think that repentance is not necessary because sin is not a problem. And they want you to make you think that sin is something that you can deal with within yourself. I stop by to tell you that if anybody teach you that you can deal with your sin problem, run as far as you can from them. Because these philosophers, these brilliant folks, these scholars, these people who are uh, considered the great minds of the day was so bright that they forgot the simplicity of a risen savior. See, the reality is if you could deal with the sin problem, we wouldn't need a savior. But the reality is you can't deal with your sin problem. My son, one of my sons, he's a doctor. He's a brilliant medical mind, a brilliant young man. He, he, he's going to learn so much about medicine. His knowledge about medicine is going to expand. And as much as he can do medically, there's one thing he can't do. And that save itself. These philosophical dualists that Paul is talking about has infected the church. In other words, the church started to believe this, uh, uh, this preaching and teaching about this. Ooh, can I give you some word before we get to the text? Can I give you some stuff that I learned? When I was studying for this message, I, 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 I got some statistics that really alarmed me. I learned that 57% of preachers that graduate seminary don't even have a biblical worldview. That 20% of chancellors and 20% of presidents of these Christian seminaries don't even believe in a triune God. That 30% of Christians do not believe that Jesus is himself resurrected from the dead. 40% believe it, but don't believe it as the Bible said. 20% of Christians don't even believe it at all. And 28% don't even know. Listen, people of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ is in the hands of folks that don't even believe in a gospel of a risen savior. In other words, the gospel, the graveless gospel is penetrating the church. So now we have the situation where folks think that they're going to go somewhere better than being with Christ. And they think that you can act a certain way. And Paul is telling them, how in the world can you live? under a graveless gospel. I'm going to teach us today, and we're going to look at three points really quickly. And God, I wish that I could just sit and dissect this. This is so much work, but I got to give it to you in a way that you can digest it here. So, 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 so let's go to work a little bit in the text and watch how Paul gives us the disastrous outcome of a graveless gospel. Those of you at home that believe in Jesus Christ, I want you to understand something. Rest and rejoice in the fact that the cross was finished, but it wasn't over. Rest and be joyous 
in the fact that we serve a God who has risen. Rest in that fact. Paul says this, though, if you do not believe in the grave, in the grave of, of the grave gospel, if you have a graveless gospel, he says, watch. This is what you have to worry about. Three things you have to worry about if you believe in a graveless gospel. Look with me in verse 13. He says, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then your preaching is in vain. The first point I want to show you, that if there is a graveless gospel, then your preaching is porous. The word porous, P-O-U-R-O-U-S, porous, it leaks, it has no value. In other words, if you are really a gospel-centered, Christ-centered preacher, you understand that the word centers around Christ. If you believe that the body now can't be resurrected because these dualists thought that if the body resurrected, then that's like reincarcerating the spirit and the spirit now is trapped. And so they did not believe in bodily resurrection. Come here, come here. They were challenging not the resurrection so much of Christ, but they were challenging the resurrection of those that believe in Christ. They were saying there is no way that someone in a body can be risen. And so now the issue here, now Paul is saying, if that is true, then the preaching that we're preaching is a problem. See, everybody agreed that Christ was a man. That wasn't the problem. The Bible speaks clearly that Christ was a man. The Bible here says, look at the text here in 1 Corinthians 15. If you look at verse number 21, it says, For since one man came death, by another man came also the resurrection of the dead. Look at the Bible says in Galatians 4 and 4 that the Bible says that when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son born of a woman. Look at Acts 2.22. The Bible says that Jesus of Nazareth, a man that God approved. Look at 1 Timothy 2, uh, 4 and 5. It says that Christ uh, is the one who saved us. He is the mediator. The Bible says that there's one mediator between man and God, and that's the man of Christ Jesus. The manhood of Christ was never a question. But if you have a graveless gospel, here's where we separate if you have a graveless gospel, the word A or, or, or just an A is mixed up. See, if you understand who Christ is, he was a just man. The Bible says that they found no fault in him. But if you have a graveless gospel, then he was just a man. You, you see that? I say it again. I say it again. If you understand Christ, he was a just man. But if you don't understand Christ... He was just a man. And what happens here when you have a graveless gospel, you have neglected the deity of God. Here it is. Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Christ was not 50% man and 50% God. Christ was 100% man and 100% God, that Christ was the fullness of God. He was the full revelation of God to man. He was all man and he was all God. And if that is not true, then when the Bible says in Romans 10, 9, that God got him up, that's not true. Then what the Bible says in Romans 8, 9 through 11, that the spirit got him up, that ain't true. And what the Bible says in John chapter 10, that Christ said he got himself up, that ain't true. In other words, God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son is a lie. And if God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son is a lie, then what we're preaching about is in vain. Paul is saying, how ridiculous a thought is that? That if you believe that Christ is not alive, then our preaching is not valid. And if the preaching is not valid, then whatever saved you is not valid, and your salvation is a problem. People of God, don't allow these philosophical uh, thoughts to integrate the trueness of the gospel. In fact, Christ is God in the flesh. In fact, Christ did die. In fact, God did get him up. In fact, the spirit did get him up. In fact, God got himself up. In fact, God indeed 
is the son of God who was risen from the dead. But Paul is saying, if you believe in a graveless gospel, then we got to challenge the preaching. If there's no gospel, then there's no redemption. Oh, Holy Ghost, look, oh God, here's a download. Let me give it to you and I get to the second point. When God made Adam, here's something that's very interesting. Not only he was already grown, but when God made him, God was making two Adams. Uh, the, the Bible in 1 Corinthians 15, in, in the 40s, around 44, 45, it talks about uh, the first Adam that was made a living soul and the second Adam that was a life-giving spirit. Watch this. When God made Adam, from the dirt. The Bible said that he blew into him and he became a living soul. But God blew his spirit into man. Why did God blow his spirit into man? Well, God understood that even in creating Adam, he was creating the Adam of the flesh, the first Adam, but he was also creating a space for Christ to come. Adam was literally an earth suit for Jesus. For the Bible says that Christ came in the flesh. He left all of that glory and came into the flesh and God cleaned out the temple because he can't dwell in something that ain't holy. In other words, Christ came in the flesh so he can go to the cross, so he can die, so he can be put in a grave, so he can get up again. So if Christ is not risen. If Christ is just a man, then we're all men most miserable. The first thing we have to understand, if we believe in the graveless gospel, then preaching is in vain. The gospel is in vain and redemption is in vain. Second point here. Look what he says. He says, if Look at verse 14. If Christ be not risen, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is also in vain. Look, yea, we are false witnesses because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ and he didn't do it. So be that the dead rise not. For if Christ, for if the dead rise not, then not Christ raised. Look at verse 17. It said, if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. And you're still in your sins. Oh, God. If you believe in a graveless gospel, then your faith is puny and your sins are potent. If Christ didn't get up, our faith is pointless. The Bible says now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If Christ didn't get up in your faith, have no substance. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, that we're saved by grace through faith. So our sinfulness and faith is a bridge to God's saving grace. And if there is no faith, then we don't have access to his grace. And if we don't have access to his grace, then we're not saved. If we have no faith, then we have no hope. For if hope's a trophy, faith's the mantle. Our hope for the return of Christ is based on faith. And so if Christ did not get up, then our faith is puny, has no strength, and our sins have all the strength. The problem here is if our faith is in vain and if we're still in our sins, the graveless gospel dictates now that death reigns and not grace. What does that mean now? If we're still in our sins, then we have no hope to ever be in the presence of God. In other words, we're still under sin. And now sin that God called into being, death. Look, look, look. God called death into being. But God called death without any sting. He told Adam that if you eat of the garden, or if you eat of the tree, 
that I told you not to eat of, you'll surely die. Come here, come here. God introduced death, but he introduced death with no power. Because as long as Adam obeyed God, death had no power. But Paul is preaching here that if Christ is not the power of the resurrection, then now death got power through sin. And now the sting of death because of sin that man transferred our power to death. And so now death has power. If death has power and we're still in our sins, then we'll die in our sins. And if we die in our sins, then now the power of death has come to kill us and we have no way to fix the sin problem. If Christ be not raised, Paul is saying faith is pointless. He's saying there's no sense in having point. Uh, and no sense of having faith because you are dying your sins. So then how come the Bible says in Job that my Redeemer liveth? Then that's not true. How come in Isaiah 53 that the Bible says that he'll see the offspring of his people after he has been taken to the grave? In other words, if our faith is not strong, if Christ is not risen, then our faith is puny and we're still in our sins. Thank God that we're not under a graveless gospel. That in fact, Romans chapter 4 verse 25 tells us that he was turned over for our sins, yet risen for our justification. People of God, our faith is rooted and grounded and we have been redeemed from our sins and we are new in Christ because he has risen. But if you believe in a graveless gospel, Faith is puny. Preaching is invalid. And we're still in our sins. Thirdly, he says, if you believe in a graveless gospel, look at verse 18. It says, then everybody who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. It's, in, it's interesting. If you study out the word cemetery, the word cemetery really transforms to a word called dormitorios, which is rooted in the word dormitory, which means a place of rest. If Christ did not get up, then there's no rest. Paul is saying every believer that have died will perish. What an existence to live in this hell and then die and go to hell. If Christ did not get up, not only our preaching is porous, not only our faith is puny and our sin is potent, but then our afterlife is postponed. I talk to people all the time. And they're like, you a pastor? Yeah, I'm a pastor. Hey, check this out. What about God? And I cut him off right there. I said, look here, before we start to get in any debate about God, answer these two questions for me. I don't feel like I have the burden of proof. You have to prove to me that there ain't no God. So you tell me this. Whoever your God is or whatever you're trying to convince me, two questions you have to reconcile with me. Number one, who brought you here? And number two, who going to take you when you go? If you can't answer those two, we're arguing about nothing. See, the power of God, and he is the creator of all things. And by him being the creator, the Abba Father, the sustainer of all life, the one who holds all things together, he is also the one that takes responsibility for life. And so he is the one who brought us here, and he is the one that will take us when this is over. But if you don't believe in the risen Savior, where do you go when this life is over? See, the grave now becomes a vehicle that Christ uses to execute us and bring us to glory or to drop you off to where you're eternally separated from him. He says, if this gospel, if Christ did not raise, if you believe in a graveless gospel, check it out, y'all. Your postponement of your afterlife is here. 
I want to show you something in the Bible that's very good assurance. If you read down in verse number 55, he says, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Look at here. For the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. As I get ready to land the plane, let me help you with something. Paul says, there is no such thing as a graveless gospel. For in fact, Christ is risen. For in fact, we declare that Christ has given us victory over the sting of death that comes from the sin that we committed. God now has to come in the form of Christ, in the flesh, to snatch back the power of death that we gave to death when we sinned. And now Christ have to collect the sins of everyone in the world so that he may take all of our sins and put them on the cross. So now God does something awesome through Christ. Here it is. Watch this. Christ, first of all, takes the sins from you so death can't get us. He took my sins and he took your sins. But not only he took them, he bore them. For the Bible says he was bruised for our iniquities. He was wounded for our transgressions. So this victory comes from a Christ that went to a grave without sin. I said that too fast, didn't I? Because in your mind, you're thinking, hold on, pastor. You just said he took every one of our sins to the cross. So he's holding sin. You told us last week that God smacked and judged sin. Now you got the nerve to tell us that he went to the grave sinless. Pastor, I caught you. Pastor, you, 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 you contradicted yourself, boy. Get your thoughts together. Get your scriptures together. Get back in your word, pastor. You're off. You can't tell me that Christ went to the cross with sin, but went to the grave without it. You can't tell me that God had to come into the flesh and redeem sin in the flesh. But he took sin, but went to the grave sinless. Pastor, something wrong with you, man. To you, I say, let's go to Colossians chapter two. And let's look at this. And let's look at why we have salvation and why we have victory and why death has lost its sting and why the sting of death had been swallowed up in the victory that we got through Christ. How come we're able to celebrate this Easter about a risen Savior? Here it is. Can I direct your attention to verse 13, 14, and 15 as we get ready to leave here today? Look what the Bible says. And you being dead in your sins, because the wages of sins is death. Look, and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened or made alive together with him, having forgiven you of all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. God had to take on the sins of the world through Christ. Because sin had to qualify him to die. Watch this. But when Christ was on the cross, the Bible here tells us in Colossians that every sin that was committed was nailed to the cross. Come here, come here. Don't miss, don't miss, don't miss it, don't miss it. So every sin that was committed was nailed to the cross. And in John chapter 19, they put the inscription over the cross. Here's the king of the Jews. It's so funny because when they found out that the inscription said king of the Jews, they said, no, 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 change it. Put him who say he's king of the Jews. And Pilate said, what I've written, have written. So his cross had his name on it the king of the Jews, and every sin was nailed to the cross. 
Now watch this was interesting. The devil thought now that he had Christ because now he's on the cross and all these sins are on the cross and God has judged every sin. So watch this. When Christ was taken from the cross to the grave, all the sins that were on him were on the cross. So when they took him off the cross, they left the sins there. And so now the sin that had the sting of death could not sting Christ because every sin that would have held Christ down, he left them on the cross. My sins and your sins, he's left them on the cross. So now he goes to the grave, a sinless God. And so now the only thing that gives death is sting is sin. And so now Christ is the only one who is in the grave that's sinless. And so now Christ has the authority to go and get the keys and get back the power of hell, death, and the grave. And now the sting that death has is gone. Why? Because the sins of the world were on the cross and the sinless Savior went down into the grave and got up for us. So that's how he can have sins on the cross, but be sinless in the grave. That's why the graveless gospel is irrelevant. That's why we serve a God that has been risen. He took all of our sins and bore them and left them. And now he's got up for us. So what does that mean? Paul says that we have victory. Paul says that death have no sting. Paul says that death have no victory because Christ got up. I'll put it this way, we'll go. Everybody in the world know I love cookies. I'm, I'm, I'm a cookie fanatic. And one of the things I love about Nestle Toll House cookies is that they give samples. I love these samples. You can be walking down the mall, you can be minding your own business, somehow, some way, somebody gonna have a tray and they're gonna hand you a delicious cookie with wonderful chocolatey morsels on them. And that sample cookie is designed to let you know that everything in the store tastes like the sample. See, you won't have a sample cookie that don't taste like the rest of the cookies in the store. Okay, okay, let, let, me, let me bring it home so we can get out of here. The Bible says that Christ was the first fruits of those who slept. Come here. There are some folks who got up before. God got Lazarus up before. Jesus, Jesus raised dark people up before. The resurrection in itself wasn't the issue. What made this resurrection different than any resurrection is that he got himself up by his own power. And now he is the first fruits. Now God is the sample cookie. Hey, hey, come here, come here. Because he is the first, everything that comes after him is made of the same stuff that made him. Good news. Good news, good news. The same power that resurrected Christ is now indwelling in each and every believer. And so because he got up, you can get up. Because he got up, we can get up. The glory in a gospel that is not a graveless gospel, the glory and the truth that Christ got up is that we're made of the same stuff that he's made of. So if he got up, we get up. Don't believe me, look in the Bible. The Bible says that when Christ resurrected, there was folks who got up out the grave and they walked around because death can't hold Christ. And those of us who are in Christ, death can't hold us. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God that when they put that rock over the tomb, thanks be to God that when they sealed the tomb, Thanks be to God that when they had the guards there to block the tomb, all they did was lock themselves out. They didn't lock Jesus in. Because early that morning they got up and the stone was rolled away. And the angel says, why are you looking for the dead amongst the living? And they noticed his cloth laying there, his grave clothes laying there. People of God, if you ever served anyone, you know, that as long as the napkin's folded, person ain't done, that they'll be back. Can I help you with this as we get ready to go? 
on this Resurrection Sunday, every believer ought to have a picture in their mind of the grave with the folded clothes, the head wrap, the foot wrap of Christ. And that ought to remind us that he got himself up. And because he got himself up and because everything is so neat and folded, it's telling us that his work is not done. He is not only up and risen, but he's coming back. He's coming back. And the salvation of the gospel is in that truth that he bled, he died, he was buried, and he got up. Don't allow a graveless gospel to make your preaching pointless or porous. Don't let it make your faith puny huh, and your strength potent of your sins. And don't let it postpone your afterlife. For he is risen, as the Bible says, just like he said. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, O oh God, that you are indeed the resurrected Savior. We thank you, O oh God, that when you created man, you created a vehicle for you to come and enter this earth that you may redeem us back unto yourself. That the word of God said that you made yourself in the likeness of man, that you may destroy the one who had the power of death, who is the devil. God, we thank you that you risen. God, we dare not believe anything else, but that we serve a risen savior. We celebrate you today. We thank you today, oh God. We love you today. And for those that believed in a graveless gospel, Help them today to understand that without you raising up, there's no hope in the last day for us. So God, we thank you and we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. This is very important. We talked about a graveless gospel versus the gospel of death. And if you don't know who Christ is, you are operating under the gospel of death. The gospel of death is very, very simple. When you die, it's a problem. Don't you dare think when I'm dead, I'm done. The Bible tells you this very clearly that uh, uh, it's appointed man wants to die. But after that, the judgment is never over. But I got news for you. If you don't know who Christ is, let me help you right now. First Corinthians chapter 15. Let me read it for you. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you which also you have received by which you stand, by which you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believe in vain, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received, how Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. And that, my friend, is what will save you if you're here today and you don't know Christ. And if you're at home and you're watching and you're waiting for this to end so you can go do an Easter egg hunt or you can go uh, have dinner or you can go enjoy the sun and go and do whatever you need to do. Don't leave this broadcast without understanding that you need a gospel that is rooted in a grave that features a risen Savior. Get Christ today. Secondly, you may be here and you say, yo, I know who Christ is and I understand who he is. We invite you to come and you'd like to be a part of this fellowship of this church. We invite you. I love to serve you. I love to continue to co-labor with you in the gospel. Thirdly, we're praying for all those out there who in the midst of this crisis have the gospel message on their tongue and that will reach people who are on fertile ground who are ready to hear a life changing gospel. For those people we're praying that they be blessed in their endeavors to build the kingdom. If you're looking for salvation, go to agapechristianwc.org. Message us on Facebook. Message us on YouTube. What better way than to celebrate Easter than to give your life to Christ? Salvation through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Fellowship with this church. 
there's none. We thank you. God bless you. And may you have an awesome rest of your resurrection day. I want to thank you all for being with us on this morning. Thank you for spending your Resurrection Sunday with Agape Christian Worship Center. And I'm just praying God's blessings upon your life and that you continue to rest in the fact that we serve a risen Savior. To all of you, if this is your first time with us, we thank you for being with us this morning. We pray that the praise and worship blessed you. We pray that a prayer blessed you or inspired you. Or we pray that the word of God have given you some insight onto the revelation knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'd like to let you know that we have some things going on this afternoon. We'll be doing um, some animated uh, uh, Easter stuff for our kids on today at three o'clock online on our Facebook and YouTube. Uh, you're welcome to go there. Uh, we also have a whole lot of content going out. We're continuing with our devotionals. We're continuing with our Bible studies. Uh, we're also continuing with our Friday night cahoots, which was a blast. Uh, couple nights ago. So we're just uh, continuing to try to provide you all with an opportunity to stay connected with us and stay connected to the word of God. So God bless you and I love you all. And if there's any out there who desire to give or contribute to sow a seed to this ministry, we want to give you that opportunity now. For all of those who are part of the Agape family, you can continue, continue to use your Give Plus app for your offerings. Um, also, if you're out there and you desire to give or donate online, you could donate at agapechristianwc.org. And those of you who desire to uh, send your offering through mail, our mailing address is P.O. Box 776, Victorville, California, 92393. So I love you all. God bless you and God keep you all. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. And to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. And to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Let the people of God say amen. Wherever you are, say amen. Say amen again. God bless you. I love you. We'll see you next week. Have an awesome resurrection day.